Hello there. I am Chris Schmidt from grayscalegorilla.com where we do tutorials and we do training and we do tools to help make you a better motion designer. But today we're going to be talking about tips, tricks, and techniques in Cinema 4D. So why don't we dive right on in? First up is bevel inversion. This is just kind of a fun technique that kind of started to be able to work when they added in the new bevel options. So very simple scene here. We just got a cube. Let's change our display options. I'm going to hit the letters N, B, so we can actually say our edges. Let's grab our cube, give ourselves a couple extra subdivisions here. I'm going to type in 11, 11, 11, because that's faster than typing 10. And let's go ahead and grab a, well, you can do it the deformer. You could also do it by, uh, uh, just doing the shortcut to the bevel tool. But we can throw that in. Let's go ahead and change this to point mode, though. And I'm going to say that uh, I want to limit it, because if you don't uh, limit, you'll shoot right past the points. But let's go ahead and turn on the limit here and start increasing our offset. And once the offset goes to the maximum amount, you will see that we've turned everything 45 degrees. So we'd have to, like, you know, bake this down or combine it so we could grab the cube. And I'm going to hold down... Uh, Let's see, what is that? The uh, alt, hold down the uh, alter option. You can create the connect object, make that editable, and now you've baked that down, and it even welded the caps together. Otherwise, you'd have to optimize. But you can now see that we've gone and made a funky, inverted, weird piece of geometry. I'm not sure what you'd do with this, but it's really fun. And uh, you can go ahead and do this uh, with any geometry, really. Something with even polygons usually looks best. We can go ahead and grab a regular old sphere here. Let's go ahead and uh, increase our poly count. And uh, let's do it the manual way this time. Let's go ahead and select all of our points. Hit, uh, what is it, uh, M. S is the bevel tool. Let's go ahead and limit that. And uh, instantly you see that went and switched this. Uh, and now we do have to select it all and optimize. So the shortcut for that is UO. So that's optimize that. And you can do things like do a quick loop selection here. Just do a bunch of rings, funky stuff here. Let's do a quick extrusion. You know, just a really fun way of getting new geometry. And I have no idea how I'd do that otherwise. So just a fun thing to do. So, moving on, what is next? I don't even know. Scale the timeline. This is a super quick one. This is super easy. So, if we go ahead into this file, let's say you've gone and you've increased your timeline. It's 999 because that's faster than typing in 1,000. You can go ahead and just double click on your little timeline bar. It's going to automatically snap to the overall time. Just save yourself a click. So, let's go ahead and jump into whatever is next. Select through objects. So, it's not unusual. You're going to have a big, complicated scene, lots of different stuff all the way through the entire thing. I need to select it somewhere. Uh, recently, Chad and I did a spot for the Happy Toolbox, uh, some models that we sell, and we made this whole spot. And something that I did, definitely found useful while working on it is it can be really hard to go and select a very specific object. But if you hold down the Shift key and right click, then it will pop up a menu showing all the objects that your mouse is kind of shooting through. So if I want to specifically select the icing off of this donut, I can go ahead and select that, and it is now selected. In addition to that, I used to talk all the time, a really important tip to me was uh, scroll to first active object. And they went and made a default shortcut to it, which is great. So I can just go over here. As long as my mouse is over the object manager, I can hit the letter S, and it's going to now find that object and automatically expand the hierarchy and scroll me right to it. So that's great. And I can go ahead into the viewport, and if I use S, it will actually zoom in on whatever is currently selected. So at the letter S in this context, and it's going to actually zoom up on that donut. So a really quickly way of selecting things and then zooming up on it in your viewport and zooming up on it in your object manager. Next up, we have text geometry. So whenever you're using any kind of font in 3D, it, it tends to be kind of a pain in the butt to do anything with it because fonts weren't designed for 3D or for 3D modeling or 3D animation. They're just not built that way. So it's really easy to go and do some sort of like quick extrude like this. But if you want to have a lot of control over your geometry, um, you know, you're, you're going to get really ugly edges in general. So something I just want to point out, like all of us love keeping things parametric. I love keeping things parametric all the time. But sometimes you just got to model it. And a lot of things are really quick to model. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes using the polygon pen tool. So we just got a font here. I'm just going to, I've just pulled up a, a simple, uh, I don't even know which font I picked here. Just something simple like an Arial. Yeah, an Arial black. Uh, got the word NAB here, and you know how messy this would be if we didn't extrude. I'm not even going to show you. You guys know what that would look like. Let's go ahead and jump to our top view here, and I'm just going to hit um, the letter ME, and that's going to pop open the Polygon Pen Tool. This got introduced a few versions ago, and it is like, it's almost all of the modeling tools combined into a single tool. So let's go ahead, and we're going, we can start drawing in here. It looks like it might have remembered my snap settings already, but if you hit the letter P, you can pop open the snap menu. I want to make sure I turn on snap, and then I would uh, go ahead and make sure I have spline turned on and vertex snap turned on. So now I've got that. You can see even as I uh, mouse over 
any part of my spline, it's snapping to it. So we can use that as a guide. And it will snap even better to a corner because it's also set to vertex. So let's go ahead and just start drawing out a polygon for ourselves here. So I'm going to go and click there. Let's click once there. Let's click once there. Over here, double click to close the first polygon. And boom, we've now created one polygon. Now I can hold down the Command or Control key and drag out an edge without even changing modes. I've dragged out an edge. And now I can just drag one of those points to snap to a corner. Let's drag this to snap to another corner. And this quickly, we can be going and modeling very clean and precise text. So let's just do this A really quickly, and then we'll jump to a completed version here. So uh, there's, uh, this, and even that, I'm gonna, you can even do it a little bit sloppy. Like if we're going to drag these polygons, I could be like, you know what, let's just do that. And then I'll do that. And let's, I know I'm going to need one here. Why don't we go ahead and drag this here? That should actually weld those two points together automatically. And this would go up here. Let's go ahead. This is going to create a triangle in general. You don't want to create triangles, but I'm going to do it here. Sorry, my mouse is being a little twitchy on me. So we can go ahead and drag that. And uh, we could make that into a triangle if we want to. Pull this down. Like I said, we can be kind of sloppy here because our final steps we can go and clean up. Even that, look at this edge will snap to that one. And we're just using the same tool for this whole thing. So I could just spend a second going through and snapping these exactly to our points to make it nice and clean and precise. Uh, just actually, you can actually cut your lines as well, which is what just happened there. So I can pull that down, pull this down. So you, you get the idea. I'm very quickly being able to drag these out. And then we're going to kind of do a, a cooking show thing here and uh, pull it out. But we're, we could go and create the final polygon here on the letter B. And then we just start dragging out a series of these, making sure that we kind of follow the arc. So I'm going to go ahead and pop open a more finalized version here so you don't have to see me going step by step. And we, uh, I want to show some additional cells. So first of all, we'd have really nice text there to kind of do whatever we want with. But if you wanted to, uh, and then some additional stuff you could do is do some like inside bevels on this. So let's go ahead and I'm going to grab a couple of these edges. And you know, uh, we can do some nice bevels in Cinema 4D, but uh, I'm even trying to, I don't know what the, what the right word is, but you know, you want like a perfect triangular shape. So I'm going to go ahead and grab these as some edges. You see I already prepped it on the other ones. And I'm going to let the shortcut MF, that's going to pop open edge cut. Make sure you turn off end gons. I'm going to hit apply. We got two cuts there. And I'm going to make sure I grab these two lines. And let's do one final one. Hit spacebar twice and you'll go back to your uh, previous tool. Hit apply, and I got a cut. Now, that cut didn't go where I wanted it to, so I'm going to go back to our polygon pen tool, and if I hold down Command or Control, and I can just click it, it'll erase that one out. And I can just click, and uh, I'm going to click once and drag, and that just did like a knife tool command. Once again, just straight up the polygon pen tool. So you see we got all these really nice edges going. Let's go back to a 3D view, and we can do some quick loop selections here. If we go ahead and say stop at boundary edges, it'll actually just select our line. And then, oh, doesn't want that one, but let's do that. Carefully select this one, hit spacebar to toggle between the tools. And we could go and do selections on all of these if we just wanted to take a second to do it. So let's grab those edges, those edges. I'm going to deselect these. So you see, I've got these selected. I could go ahead and just drag these up into the air. We're going to get some nice, clean, sexy bevels. But you'll see right here that, OK, that one might want to be triangulated. So we can jump back to our polygon pen tool, ME shortcut. And we could do some final cuts here, cut from there to there. Maybe cut from there to there. And even like these corners. Oh, OK, now we got like this void. But I can just, once again, hold down Command, drag from one corner to another, close that off, drag from one corner, close that off. We could do that everywhere, doing these cuts. Create really clean geometry. If you spend a little bit of time, you can prepare your fonts manually. And you can use it what you, you know, any font you want as a guide. Snap it to it really quickly using the Polygon Pen tool. And you can make exactly what you want. So moving on to the next one, H. P B. What does H P B stand for? Um, so everybody knows they're X Y Z, but then we got H P B. What do those stand for? Well, they stand for heading, pitch, and bank. So we got our nice little airplane here, ready to fly around. Now, important thing to note in Cinema 4D, Cinema 4D considers forward Z plus. So. It's kind of like the front of this plane is facing Z+. Plus. If you had a character, their nose would be pointing on Z+. Plus. That's what Cinema 4D considers forward. And if you think in that way, then a lot of things like the targeting tags and constraints, all that will make more sense if you think of it that way. So now that we've got that going, um, I often will confuse, and you'll even see if you watch any of my tutorials, I often am like, OK, which do we need to rotate on? This one? Nope. This one? Nope. So I'm trying to get better at that. So this is an attempt to uh, help me with that. So we've got our airplane here. So the first one is heading. So OK, that's pretty simple. Which way is our plane heading? So if I grab the plane and rotate it, that is our heading. 
Now, bank and pitch are the ones that are really easy to confuse. Heading, I think, is pretty straightforward. So pitch is if you're going to start going upward and downward. So that seems that's straightforward, but I'm not going to remember that well. But what I think is going to help me remember is banking. Because if you think of an airplane or something flying around, it's going to be banking. You're dodging other bullets flying through the air. So you're like... So that's your banking. Uh, and hopefully that'll help you remember, and hopefully that'll help me remember. And, you know, we'll find out in my next tutorial if that catches. So, uh, collapsing panels. So this isn't actually something I do very often, but it's pretty neat. Um, we got these little control tabs up on the top, and I have now forgotten the name of them, but they got a weird name. Uh, and if you just hold your middle mouse button, if you click it as a button, it will automatically, automatically collapse it. And you can just click it again, and it will pop it back open. So if you don't have enough room in your object manager and you want to maximize it really quickly, I mean, I know often I'm grabbing this and pulling it down, so I need more room or less room, depending on how many attributes an object might have. But I could just quickly collapse that down and then do whatever I need and then pop it back up again. So really nice to be able to collapse all those down. And of course, you might go and accidentally collapse too many things down or collapse that, and that starts disappearing, and you get things looking all funky. And if, you get, if things get crazy and you get a little bit lost, then just remember, you always go back to your startup layout and say, you know what, I want to go back to startup, and you're back to the beginning. Let me just uh, get my panel to correct scale again. All right, so yeah, middle mouse button on the panels. Offset with fall off. This one's a little bit specific, but I thought it was a cool technique. And it's, it's almost like a design space to think about something, uh, some of the effectors in MoGraph. Uh, so I wanted to share that. So here we've got a pretty standard setup, a type of thing I talk about pretty often. We've got a cloner, and the cloner is set to blend. And what that is doing is it's blending between two identical hierarchies. So you see they have the exact same objects. They're all parametric. So it has got a nice small circle and then a big circle, and it will transition between those no matter how many I put into this count. So that's really fun, really straightforward. We do that all the time. Now, I want to do kind of like this ripple effect cascading, like a drop of water hit, and I want to ripple through. Well, there's a whole bunch of different effectors and things we might be able to do with that, but the thing I would most want to do to have a lot of control over it would be to use a, just like a plane effector, and I could use a fall off to make them travel. But the problem here is that all of these objects have the exact same axis. If I were to make this editable, you'll see that every single one of the clones, their axis is right in the middle. So what that means, let me undo. It, what that means is if I go in and make a, uh, where are we going? Uh, an effector, let's make a plane effector, and we can go ahead and turn on a quick linear fall off. Let's give it a full fall off here and have it go up on Y. You'll see that as this drags through, all of them are moving identically. They've got the exact same axis. So how do we fix that? Well. We have an effector that will look at the index of the objects, the number of the object, instead of its position. And that effector is, of course, the step effector. So I'm going to click on the step effector. By default, it is uh, affecting the scale. I want to affect the position. And it's going to be an arbitrary amount. I'm going to just drag that up. And if I look at it from the side, you're going to see we get this weird bowl shape. So you kind of got this arcing in. It's kind of easing in and easing out. And that, of course, is because the step effector, by default, has this spline, and that is not linear. So let's go ahead to, to make that linear. And we should see a nice straight line there. So based on the index, each one is moving a little further than the previous one. OK, cool. Good start. Uh, so now they don't have the exact same axis anymore. So now I can grab our cloner, and let's add another effector. So I'm going to hit plane. Let's go and do it. The same setup again. I'm going to give it a linear fall off, make it full, set it up to Y plus. And now you'll see as I drag this through, it is actually successfully affecting them each individually. But of course, now the problem we see is that they're all offset. We wanted them to be flat. Well, it's really straightforward. We can go ahead and counteract that by duplicating our step effector. So let's go ahead and copy and paste that step effector and grab our cloner in the effects. In the Effectors tab, let's make sure that we add the new step effect that we just copied it is the third object. So you have to think about the order of operations here. That one calculates, and then the plane effector with the fall off calculates, and then this new one will. So if we take the new one and we set it to the exact negative amount, and even better, we can go to our strength, and we can set that to exactly negative 100. So if we change the number, they'll go. They'll uh, reset. But you'll now see that that is flat again. But what this translates to, if you think of that order of operations, is now I can pull my plane effector up through it, and each one is going to be affected offset-wise, but uh, they all still have the exact same axis. So we've tricked it into letting us work with fall-offs. And fall-offs are just, I don't know, it's just my favorite way of animating anything like this. So now if we actually wanted to get that ripple effect, I could go ahead and go to my plane effector, go to its fall-off, and right now it's just going to be linear by default. But if I go and I drag in a couple of points here, just holding down the command or control button to add some new points, 
Let's go ahead and maybe round that out a little bit more. Now, as I grab my plane effector and pull it up, you're going to see we get a ripple traveling right through it based off of fall off. And we could control all of our animation and the length and the transition all entirely based off of this. And even that, we could go and grab both of our step effectors. And by changing the uh, position here, we can actually change how much they've been offset. So they could be a little bit more uniform. They could be a you know, it's a lot more distinctly separated. So just a fun little rig and a way of thinking of layering, even uh, layering effectors up so that one might counteract the other one, but it's enabled new functionality for you. So moving on, we've got Super PolyClean Redux. So I mentioned this one in my last 50 minutes of tips and tricks, and that was a fun technique for really super cleaning up unnecessary geometry in a model. I think it messes up your UVs, but it would super clean up your model. And that relied on the poly reduction deformer, but recently they've introduced the poly reduction generator, which is a completely different thing, and the process didn't work anymore. And I just want to make sure that anybody who liked that process would be able to continue doing it. So uh, we're going to do it again. Uh, and I just want to mention that if you go to the uh, deformer menu, it is not here. But if you go to the uh, search functionality, so let's hit Shift C, I'm going to search in reduction. And you see we've got a, the generator version, but we can still get at the regular deformer polygon reduction. So let me just show you that technique again real quick because it's fun. Normally, if you go and you like convert this to end gons, you're going to be left with all of your extra points. You'll get rid of the edges, but you'll have all the points. We can get rid of all those by grabbing this polygon reduction, dropping it inside the object. And if we grab our reduction strength and we drop it all the way down to zero, we're not reducing at all. But it is now super optimized all of their different polygons. It triangulated it, but all of the points have disappeared. And you'll see if I turn that off, we've got like extra points all over the place. Like look at all of these redundant points that won't be doing anything for our final model. So if we go ahead and turn that on, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and throw this into a connect object because that will automatically weld it for me. So I'm going to hold down Alt Option as that's made. It's now welding. I can make that editable. And if we go ahead and select our geometry, I can right click and untriangulate. Make sure you hit the gear because then we can make sure we turn on create end guns. Hit OK. And now you can see that we've super reduced all of the geometry on this to only the necessary ones. By using that technique, only flat surfaces will remain and everything else will be removed. And if I go to points, then you'll see that even the points have been reduced to be super clean. So that's how you can still do that technique. And I really like that one. OK, the animation palette. So I didn't even know that was the name of it. I just called this the timeline. But this is the animation palette down here. And I just want to talk about a couple neat tricks in it. So I've got a little animation here I did a while ago with Psy, the cylinder guy. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And you see I just got this character. Falls in the scene. Does a little animation. And goes and crawls up out of the scene. And then immediately plummets back in again. So we've got this animation. I'm going to go ahead and go into my character. In fact, I want to make sure I grab all of his controls. He's got keyframes all over the place. He's got you know two dozen controls on him all over. And I want to grab all of those. So uh, I've talked about before you can make a selection object. And uh, if you, let's see, where does that even live? I think, yeah, if you go under select, selection filter, you can make a selection object. I've already got one prepared here. So it's got all of my different controls. So if I go ahead and double click that, it will select all of my controls. You can see all these spines, all this madness of all these things. But the main thing you're going to see is we got all of these different keyframes going here. Normally, you're gonna, you would want to go into the F-curve editor or the timeline. But there are some really cool things you can do directly in this menu. I want to talk about a few of them. So uh, the very first thing is selecting it. It's probably not unusual for you to go and select some of your uh, keyframes. First of all, you got to be really careful. A lot of people trips me up a lot. But anywhere on this top part, if you select it, just jumps the time. But if you go and you make sure your mouse is right down where the keyframes actually live, you can actually make a selection. So if you click and drag, you can select multiple keyframes. Now, uh, that's, that's all well and good. And we can grab those and move them. And as long as you have that object selected, you're now moving all the keyframes associated with that object. So pretty straightforward. But it's probably likely that you are like, oh, now I want to grab this keyframe. And you're like, oh, I want to grab that. Oh, you can't make a selection because now you're dragging and moving it. So what you've probably done is gone and you know, fiddled around trying to deselect that somehow. And then you can move off to the side and maybe click one time. OK, now I've deselected it and you're dragging in. But there is a better way. You can go and drag your selection, move it around, do whatever you want. If you hold down Shift, and you click, you'll just erase it out. So really quickly, get rid of the selection. I know that used to trip me up a whole bunch. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is if you right click here, you get a whole bunch of cool timeline options. And uh, there's way too many for me to go through all of them. But you can go and change your linear. You can change your step, your spline. But you can also change your easing in, all of your uh, yeah, eases, ease in, ease out. 
Uh, that's fun. But the one I wanted to mention was the Ripple Edit. If we turn on Ripple Edit, any change that we make here, let's just grab, say, that one keyframe here. If Well, actually, let's even find a specific time. Okay, let's say right here, I want to make sure that this part of my animation is just going to lie flat on the ground for longer. I just go ahead and grab this, time, this, uh, this given keyframe here. And if I start moving it forward, you'll see every single keyframe in front of that one is going to move along with it. So I can just lengthen it up without having to worry about grabbing my entire timeline. It could even be the animation can be longer. It's going to grab it and push it further along. And if we grab something over here, we start pulling them back, everything will move back with it. So Ripple Edit is a really nice, fun way of controlling this while still just being in your animation palette and not having to go into your timeline and your F-curves and make sure making sure you grab all of your points and pull them back. Nope, you can just make sure you have your object selected and turn on Ripple Edit and just drag it across. So that was some hints on the animation palette. Jumping on, we've got Ensides and Lofts. I talk about this a lot if you watch uh, Ask GSG, which is a live show that I run uh, every week on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock Central Time. We do two hours of live streaming where we just answer questions from the audience. Anybody hanging out, asking questions, we try and recreate cool art from other artists. In fact, I've met some people in this week who was like, oh, I... Somebody asked me how to make your animation that we were figuring out. Uh, it's really fun, and I talk about this all the time there. Uh, and that is, I never use circle splines anymore. I only use end sides. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about loft. So let's go ahead and jump into this file. Really straightforward uh, little, little model of a potion bottle. I've been playing with a 3D printer a bunch. I've been doing a whole bunch of this. And the loft has been really useful for that because you get really nice, clean meshes. But I want to talk about how you can keep these super clean. This hierarchy is built entirely with circles. So if I turn off the loft, you're going to see I've got a whole series of circles here. And when the loft lofts them, then you get this model here. So uh, the first thing I want to mention is uh, let's say we wanted this to be a six-sided bottle. So we go to our mesh subdivision on top of our loft, and we can type in 6, but you actually don't want to type in 6. If I type in 6, we're actually going to get 5 sides. When you're in your loft and you want to see how many kind of points are getting swept around, always go one higher than the actual count that you want of polygons. So I'm going to actually type in 7 there. So OK, now we actually do successfully have 7 edges here. But you see, it's not round anymore. It's all weird and funky and offset. And that's because these are circle spines. And the loft doesn't know how to interpret a circle spine. Because the circle spine, by default, it's set to angle. It's set to adaptive, and the angle is 5 degrees. So every 5 degrees, it's making another point, And it's trying to interpolate between those. It doesn't know where to do the subdivisions. So, and we could go and grab all the circles and try and you know, change that. We could go and say, you know what? I want something like natural or uniform. But even having done that, it's not actually changing our end result here. So I've got the exact same hierarchy here. And actually, here's a cool shortcut. If you hold down Command or Control uh, and you click your checkbox, let me twirl this open so you can see. If you hold down Command or Control, if you click the checkbox, it will turn everything in that hierarchy off or on. So I'm going to turn that one off. And let's go ahead and turn this one on. And I have an identical hierarchy, but this time with end sides. And what's great about end sides is it's exactly like a circle, except you can type in exactly how many sides you want. So it's very, very precise. You get a lot of control over it. So along those lines, we can go back, turn on our loft, and I can say, you know what? I want exactly six sides, which means seven. And it's going to be look all funky there. But now we can go to our end sides, select all of them. And I'm going to set this to exactly six. And now, and if I successfully selected all of them, oh, sorry, I messed something up there. But you'll see, at least up on the top here, we're getting exactly six sides going around. Now, an additional thing that I wanted to talk about is um, oh, how the uh, loft interprets the uh, polygons. Normally, actually, I've changed my default, or not, I haven't changed my default, but normally this is subdivided a lot more heavily. You see, normally you'd probably be getting a whole bunch of different edges like this, and that can be kind of imprecise if you're trying to model something very, very precisely. So the first thing I usually do is go to my mesh subdivision V, and I drag that all the way down. But you'll see that this actually still has more polygons than I have splines. It's actually got twice as many. And that's because you also have a subdivisions per segment checkbox. If you turn that off, then now it is literally just a connection between each of your splines and... You can, you know, so now we're getting very precise modeling. So it would be very easy to go and select any of these, change the uh, number of sides here. In fact, I could jump this back up to 65, grab all of my end sides, jump this back up to 64. So those should be kind of identical now. And we're getting a perfect translation where that end sides point is, exactly where the lofts point is. So moving on to the next one, we have proximal fall off. This one's fun. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but 
I use Cinema 4D for lots and lots of different things. Like I'm constantly finding new excuses to use it in, yeah, in ways that you probably it would probably be faster if I knew some of the other tools. But one thing I did uh, in this case is I run a game of Dungeons and Dragons, and I have to make maps all the time. So there's no faster way of doing that than making it in Cinema 4D. So I've got a scene here where I got a cloner. It's making some nice trees. I've got some simple geometry here for buildings. Use some Sketch and Tune. You get some nice lines. And I was even able to overlay a grid on top of it with Sketch and Tune. It's just really fun to be able to do this kind of stuff in Cinema. It's super quick. It's a super light scene. It's, you know, like all the time. Uh, it's like, okay, uh, these trees aren't laying out exactly the way I want to. Well, first of all, you can see that those are cloning along a spline, so I did kind of place them exactly where I wanted. But at a given point, you could always go and change your step. You could increase the number that you want. You could go and offset, randomize. There's so many different things you can do by just thinking about things parametrically and with cloners and with all of your different effectors. It's so much fun to create this kind of stuff. It's pretty addictive. Um, but I want to talk specifically about the proximal shader. I actually have an entire tutorial on Grayscale Gorilla all about the proximal, but this is another use that I thought was kind of fun. So this was actually kind of an ancient town. It was all supposed to be kind of ruined. So I want to have this old path drawn in here. So what I'd probably do would be to jump into the uh, pen tool or maybe the sketch tool, and I could just start drawing out a line where these roads are supposed to travel. I've already got one prepared, actually, here. So let's just go ahead and pop that open. And I'm actually going to go ahead and hide all that geometry. So you can see I've drawn out a spline, and I didn't even close it. It's just right there. Um, so this is what I want the path to be. But I want it to look like an old, worn-out path. So the first thing I'll do is turn it into some sort of geometry. So we'll just grab a loft. I love me some lofts. Drop that in. And boom, we've got a piece of geometry. Cool. And I've already got a road texture set up in here. It's just, it's just a couple noises layered up on top of each other. I could drop it on there. If I hit render, you're going to see we got a nice road. It's all set up, ready to rock already. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump into that road and... Uh, I, you know, go into the alpha channel. Let's go ahead and turn on alpha. And I'm going to go ahead and let's just, mm, let's go ahead and immediately go to our proximal. So I'm going to make a proximal shader. So you go down to effects, you go down to proximal. So what is a proximal shader? The proximal shader is a shader that essentially just creates a fall off in 3D space based on whatever points you feed into it. So the points that we're going to feed in the, into it are going to be based off of this spline. So let's go ahead and drag in the spline. And we're going to turn on use of vertices. Now, in addition to that, I want to make sure to point out that in my spline, normally this would be set to adaptive, but I changed it to subdivided. I really love subdivided because you can set a maximum length. So that means every five units, it's going to create another point. So that means our proximal is seeing a little circle fall off every five units in the scene. So now we've got that. We can go ahead and... Let's see. Actually, we can even see in the viewport a little bit. Let's hit render. And it's going to look a little weird because I think our scale is way off. In fact, we can just see everything because it's so big. So let's go ahead and shrink this up. So I want this to be 10 units. It says percent, but it's actually in units. Um, so at 10 percent, it means 10 units. So 10 centimeters in this case. If I hit render now, OK, cool. You're seeing something different. It looks a little bit funky. What's happening is we're only seeing the edges that are close to it. That's where the points are, and that's where it's telling it to be. So close, but no cigar here. First, uh, first thing we need to do is it's very it's it's blowing out a little bit and that's because the blend mode is set to add so there's a whole series of circle gradients and they're overlaying each other and getting brighter and brighter and brighter i'm going to say i don't want to keep getting brighter i want if they were already a certain brightness it can't get brighter so just by changing that we're going to see a fall off on here it's looking a little funky here because i actually have ambient occlusion turned on so uh, go to our good old trusty compositing tag. So I'm going to right click on our loft. Let's go to the Cinema 4D tags, add a compositing tag, and we'll just say, don't see the ambient occlusion. Cool. So let's go ahead and render that again. And now you'll see that we've got a nice fall, of, nice fall off here. But it's kind of the exact opposite of what we want. We want to see the rest of it and not this falling, out, falling off bit. So let's go ahead and jump out into the alpha channel here. And instead of the proximal being directly in, let's drop this proximal into a layer shader. I love the layer shader. So I can create that. The important thing to note right away is if you're using the layer shader in the alpha channel, you have to turn off image alpha. Otherwise, it won't work. So now it's working exactly the same. Nothing's changed. If I hit render, it look identical. But now we can go into a layer sh the layer shader, and I can right click on any anything that we feed into here. And we can say invert image. So now white has become black, and black has become white. And if I render that, you can now see that we get a nice fall off on these edges. But of course, that could just be the start if we wanted it to be. We can go ahead and make some noises here. Let's make a noise. 
go to one of my favorite ones, maybe Naki. Naki is great for all sorts of organic things. So if I were to hit render right now on that, we can kind of see the overall scale. It's just kind of making it a little bit patchy. In fact, I kind of like that. So you know what? I'm going to make a duplicate of that noise. You can actually, if you click the image and drag it, it automatically makes a duplicate of it. If you grab the, no the name and move it, it will move it. So nice little shortcut there as well. Let's hide one. And let's just take this one. And actually, I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I need to multiply your screen. So let's just try multiplying. I'm going to multiply that. And OK, I did do it correctly there, where now we get the fall off and this overlay. But you know what? Instead of multiplying, something that's kind of fun would be something like maybe the lever. I think you call it, you pronounce it lever. Don't use this one too often, but this will just take the two images and do like a literal black and white translation between them. So I usually get with these nice rough edges, like perfectly in there, making that look nice and worn out. And now I could take this one and say multiply on top of it. So now we get those nice rough edges there, but we're also multiplying this one on to erase out additional elements from it. So I can pull back on this a little bit. Let's see, just find a nice balance there where it looks a little worn out. We got these messed up edges. And what's cool about this whole setup here is we can always go back to our original object. We can go back to this spline here, and I could grab a point and be like, you know what? Maybe that should be down here. Or we can grab this path and drag it out further there. And it's all looking at the proximal. It's automatically subdividing. Actually, that was a bad example there because this road is not fat enough to see it. So let's grab that and pull these up. That should be bigger. So now we've got this patch up here. So it's just automatically updating with that. So we can go ahead and turn everything back on again. Let's do another quick render. And there we go. Now we've got our messed up path on top of here. And it's a nice parametric rig that we could honestly copy and paste into different scenes, build, a whole build up a whole library of these different textures and materials and rigs, and make all the Dungeons & Dragons maps you can imagine. So moving on. We've got too many objects. OK, so Cinema 4D can handle a lot of polygons. It does not mind a lot of polygons. But it doesn't like a lot of objects. You could have one object with a million polygons, no problem. But it'd be a bad idea to have a million objects, each with one polygon. So just as an example, uh, I've got a scene here from one of my favorite tutorials ever, which was uh, like fast topographies. Uh, so you make these really cool like pillar sculptures. Not my original idea, but I have a, a tutorial on how to make these really quick. So what's awesome about this is uh, this in Cinema 4D is being considered pretty much one object. So in spite of literally having a million pillars here, I'm getting like instantaneous feedback in our viewport here. So as long as it does that initial calculation, it's going to go really quick. Now, in this particular example, and what we do in that tutorial is we're using hair. And all these hairs are sticking straight up, and they're taking in the height map from an image. Uh, but we're telling hair to generate a spline. But the, the spline is being generated as a single object. So it's not a million different splines. It's one spline with a million lines in it. And then it is then extruding it, or I think in this case, sweeping it. So at that point, this is turning into just three objects. Well, you got. You've got the hairs, which are splines, and then you've got a sweep, and then you've got the front cap and the back cap. So there's only like four objects in the scene, so it's running incredibly quick. Um, so the important thing to note here is you just want to, when you, you know, I love keeping things parametric, but at a certain point, save off that file, move into a new one, and bake everything down to a, the smallest number of objects possible. Uh, I actually want to get to some slightly what I think is a more interesting one, so I'm not going to break this one down. But this, was, this scene is going to be moving pretty slowly, but I could collapse down all of my different groups of objects, and then our viewport would be moving just as quick as it was with those pillars. But let's move on to a more fun one. Uh, Bouncy Springs. I didn't get to talk about this one too much. In fact, it might be another decent one to skip. I got uh, 17 minutes. Um, I think we can talk about it. Let's do it. OK, so uh, we've got a pretty s straightforward setup here. I've got three dynamic objects. We've got the bottom one, which is static. It's a collider body. And then we've got these other two. And they are linked together via these connectors. And we are actually using the ragdoll connector. And the way I like to think about the ragdoll connector is like those little uh, those little things you put around a dog's collar when you don't want, after it got surgery, you don't want it to chew itself. So its head can't move beyond a certain point. So that's what we got going on here. These objects can't move beyond their little dog collar. So they're moving around like this. So that's all well and good. But I don't want these just flopping over. That's as far as they're allowed to. But I want them to have a little bit of stiffness here. So springs are really cool. And I ignored springs for a long time. But if you haven't played with them, first play with connectors. Not enough people play with connectors. But after you play with connectors, start playing with springs. So if I make a spring here, and let's just go ahead and drop it down inside of our first object here. I want to link this spring from, let's see, yeah, that's the base. So I want to link it from the base to the next object. And then let's copy this spring. 
And this spring, I want to connect the middle object to the third object. Cool. So we got two springs. Those are automatically connecting, I think, in the correct positions. And if we hit play right now, they're going to be working pretty well. It should be adding a little bit of stiffness to it. But if you really want to make these work, you got two key settings you want to use. Let's grab, select both of our springs. And those two settings are, first of all, the stiffness. And we can jump the stiffness up to something like 10. If we hit play, um, it should be, it's going to be doing a little bit better of a job. But the really magical setting here is actually taking the spring and scaling it beyond the default. In fact, uh, a good thing I should have done here was hit set rest length. And that's automatically going to set this spring to be the exact length, which is the distance between the center point of one object to the other object that it's connected to. But if we go and we select both of those and we make that spring larger, so uh, you see those are two different values. So if I want to each have each of them be larger, we can do a little bit of math inside of Cinema. So you just type in X, and X is whatever that object's current value is. I can say X times two, and now each of those springs has jumped to twice of the length. It's you know double the rest length that we had before. So it's trying to scale it up even taller. So now we've added additional stiffness here. And now you'll see that we're actually, they're not flopping off to the edge of that. And we're actually getting some control over this looking nice and wiggly jumping back and forth. So even more than stiffness, increasing the rest length beyond the default like set parameter is a really good way of adding in this kind of springiness onto your objects. Doo -doo -doo. All right, shadow as texture. I did this one recently. It's kind of fun. Um, so we just got a whole bunch of models here, and I've got a light. This light is set as a parallel light. It's pointing straight up. It's up in the air, pointing straight down, and we've got a hard shadow set. So I can go ahead and hit render, and boom, we get a hard shadow. Really straightforward. But let's say we want to start manipulating the shadow a little bit. In fact, the specific technique I want to talk about here, and I'll even turn that off for a second, is everybody probably is familiar with a falloff shader. And I'm going to go ahead and make one of those really quick to demonstrate what I mean here. Let's just put in a luminance channel. Let's go ahead and make a, where do we got it? I lose it sometimes. Yeah, there it is, falloff shader. And let's just go ahead and make it black and white to demonstrate my point. This is really great if you wanted to have, let's say, snow was falling. So you were going to have it snow, do, set this up. It's like, OK, well, that's working well. But I could grab this, drag the black up to the midpoint, and hit Render. And now you can see anything that's pointing upward is now white. And remember, we're in the Luminous channel. Anything that's on the top is white. And as it curves down to the side, it is becoming black. And now anything from the midpoint down is completely black. But if this was something like snow, then th this wouldn't be white down here. Like, the snow would have been hit the, the top here, and it wouldn't have gone down to the feet. So how can we do that? Uh, well, one way that I found recently is kind of fun to do is to kind of convert a shadow into a shader. And the way I like doing that is using a shader that we don't use very often. Let's go ahead and jump back into our Lumis channel. Instead of fall off, let's go ahead and use the old Lumis shader. The Lumis shader is kind of like the color channel. Uh, as a shader. So this is a, this is before reflectance, this was a way that you could add multiple speculars into like your luminous channel or your color channel. But in this case, we actually don't care about that. I don't want the first specular or the second or the third. I just want our base kind of color channel here. I'm going to make sure we're up to white. And let's make sure it's looking at illumination 100%. So essentially now, it's almost as if we have the color shader, but I'm in the luminous channel. So now we've got our light turned on. we got the shadow turned on. If I hit render, we're getting a shadow, but we're in the luminous channel. But this can now be combined in all sorts of fun, funky ways because we've got a shader now. So we could do things like throw this into a distorter channel. And now with that, let's go ahead and throw in a noise. Let's not go overboard on it. But if I hit render here, we are now going to start getting some distortion on our shadow down at the base. But then things get more interesting because we can actually use additional. I don't want to keep that. So let's go ahead and change our shadow to a different type. Let's go ahead and set it to soft. Or actually, let's even jump right to area. So we got an area shadow. And I don't have the settings cranked up too high. But you see, we are actually getting some nice softer fall offs on here. So along those lines, we now kind of had that fall off. But let's, let's say snow was falling. Now it didn't fall. Even though this is the top of the object, there's less of it there. And we have the ability to, of course, go and grab something like the layer shader. And we could go and make another noise. And let's see, what is a good one? Uh, I don't want to use Naki again. Let's use Luca. So we've got Luca there. So we can combine these in different ways. And let's just go right away to, we don't get to use it too often, a lever, and render that. And now you're going to see that we're going to get this crazy stylized, like super funky look here because we are now manipulating the shadow as a shader. Uh, I'm not sure what to do with this, but it's really fun. And there's lots of like design space, I think, to play around with that. So I wanted to share that with everybody. 
So let's see, what is next? Bulls, this one's really important. I've been a little bit hard on bulls in Cinema 4D. There, there's still some trouble. Sometimes they can pop out of existence when you're animating an object through another one. But they are actually way better than I thought they were. And I want to walk this through with you. Uh, and I kind of discovered this. I just want to show you. I was recently working, once again, this is uh, for Dungeons & Dragons. But I was working on a character on there, this robotic creature. So I made this guy. And he's really fun. But this entire character is put together pretty much parametrically. Like, nothing's been made editable on him. But I was going crazy using bulls on this one. And the most specific crazy area is something like down in the foot here. Like, this is a series of a ton of different combined objects. But I'm getting incredibly clean geometry. In fact... It's so clean, I was able to take this and put it through my 3D printer and get a model off of this, because they're all perfect volumes. So I want to show you some hints on what makes these work a lot better. So here's maybe what you'd be expecting from a bull. And this is the way I've been working with them forever. And these settings, the settings I'm about to show you have been in cinema forever, so I feel bad that I didn't realize they were in there. Um, so you get this really kind of m this messy mesh. And it's highly likely that when you combine different things, it's going to start messing, messing up as you go deeper and deeper. And you'll see I'm actually four bulls deep just to make this one object. If I turn off all the bulls, you're going to see this is actually com a combination of all these different things to be able to make that object. Um, so as you go through, they get combined, and you finally end up with this final object. But it's all crazy, all crazy, triangulated. That's kind of the default you'd expect. But if we go ahead and we select all four of these bools, there are three check checkboxes that you should almost turn on every time. So first of all, it's already on a high-quality object. That's good. We do want a high-quality object. But normally, if you make a bool editable, usually there's two objects in the, in the hierarchy. If you turn on Create Single Object, it'll all automatically merge them down into one object. So that will merge them down into one object. One of the only problems is that it has broken our fong, but we'll solve that in a second. But here's a super important one. Hide new edges. What this is actually doing is making all of the new cuts into end gons. And by turning that on, on all four bools, we have now gotten really clean geometry here. And the fi final checkbox is create fong breaks at the intersections. If I turn that back on again, then we get our nice fong breaks back again. So those three checkboxes combined are giving us incredibly clean geometry on the bools. And it's not that just that they look, they work visually better. It doesn't look so messy. Uh, I want to show you that it actually will dramatically change the way you're doing modeling as well. So I actually get this question in an Ask GSG re recently where we, somebody wants to make these headphones. So we've got this shape here. We just kind of got this bowl shape. And then we've got a couple of rectangles that are stretched out nice and long and extruded out. Let's go ahead and create a bool. And I'm going to drop both of these objects into the bool. And we have D by default A subtract B. Those are all in a null. None of them are touching each other, so you can kind of group them up that way. So if I drag these down, you're going to see, boom, we're going to start cutting out the bool. Now, right away, you can see there's some like twitchiness there. And the twitchiness is, twitchiness is just like the triangles recalculating, making new connections to the best, most optimized way it can. But you know, uh, right away, there's going to be some problems where if we go and let's say we want to now bevel these edges. A couple different ways we can do that. But let's just try and do it parametrically. Let's make a, a bevel here. And before I drop it in, I'm going to make sure that I turn on use angle so it doesn't try and bevel everything. It's only going to try and bevel things that are bigger than uh, an angle that's sharper than 40 degrees. So I'm going to drop this in as the third object. That way you don't have to put it into a null. And you're going to see, like, right away, things are going to go nuts. It's exploding. We got edges shooting off to the edge. This broke here. Like, that's just not working at all. Uh, now, one one problem for that, obviously, is we didn't create a single object. So I can go ahead and turn on create single object. Now they're welded together. But you see, we have more additional problems. It's just kind of not working at all for us. So let's go ahead and just turn that off for a second. And instead uh, of uh, leaving it this way, you can go ahead and turn on hide new edges. So turn on hide new edges. And then look at how clean the geometry now is inside of there. In addition to that, we've got our loft up top. And this loft ha is creating, creating uh, the top base off of triangles. But I'm actually going to go to that loft. And on the cap on the loft, I'm going to say, you know what? Don't be triangles. Be a, a n-gon as well. So now that got cleaned up as well. So we've gone n-gons. And then our bool is treating everything like n-gons. So now, and uh, let's see, we're also creating a single object. So everything should be welded together. So now let's go ahead and turn on our bevel and look at that. Now we've got some bevels automatically working on there. And we go ahead and scale them up. And they are just looking great. So yes, now like essentially, like even by default, go, go home and set this as default. Because uh, hiding new edges completely transforms the way I worked with bools. And I think it will do the same for you. So sketchy variation. So. Uh, I love Sketch and Tune. Sketch and Tune is really fun. A lot of people try and be very, very precise with Sketch and Tune, but I always find that 
uh, if I'm going to be making something look sketchy, I want to like mess it up and make it look hand drawn. I'm trying to get rid of the 3D look as much as possible. So sketch and tune is really fun, but there's a lot of variation you can add that isn't just based on the sketch and tune. I've got a little character here from a short that I never continued. This is like four years old. Uh, if I hit render, you can see I've already got some basic sketch and tune set up, um, and I've got this material here I'm going to apply. And the only, this is just a couple different noises. I'm going to collapse all geometry. Grab this, and this is just actually uh, this material is just like a pen scribbled on paper, and then I took a photo of it, and I overlaid a couple noises on top of it. So if you're like me and you don't like dealing with UVs unless you absolutely have to, you probably go and you set your materials to cubic. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm gonna hit render, and you see, okay, we got kind of a pen look applied to it overall. But I want to add like a whole bunch of crazy sketchiness on here. So something I might do is I want every single frame to look different, every single frame of this material to look different, but I don't want to go, there's no animated noise or anything, it's a static material. A way we can get tons of variation in this would be to just go and do something like grab our position and our rotation at the time of zero, I can record that right there, and we can fast forward to the very end, and we can type in some crazy numbers in here. So we can just like type in a giant number there, big old giant number, we're in the, like the millions here. And we can even do the same with position. Let's put a big old giant number there. Let's record all of those and record all of those. And what that's going to essentially enable us to do is it's, it's changing and rotating everything so quickly that there should be essentially no relation from one frame to the next. So uh, if we jump to our texture here and I click on axis and we make sure we have our object selected. Um, and if we go to time zero, you can see what that it's actually right there. If I go one frame forward, it's zoomed out of the scene so far that we can't even see it. So if we were to send this over to the picture viewer, uh, we are going to see frame by frame it's completely changing just based on that one material. So that by itself is kind of fun. But I just wanted to mention that we also have uh, it's the one mention I'm going to do of a plugin. But Grayscale Gorilla makes a plugin that is my personal favorite of all the plugins we make, and that is Signal. So Signal, uh, my elevator pitch for Signal is always, it's kind of like the vibrate tag for every parameter. But it does so much more than that. It does like beats per minute and all sorts of mathematical like looping noises. So that's really fun. Let's go ahead and apply that material again from scratch. I'm going to set it to cubic. Let's go ahead and I'm even going to move it up in the air so we can see what we're doing a little bit better. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a Grayscale Gorilla signal tag. So what do I want to control there? I want to control pretty much the same thing as we just were, but we can be so much more precise with it. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the rotation. So I can actually grab the entire vector, all three of these, and drop it directly onto the signal tag. And now signal is controlling that parameter. So now I can go into this parameter, and I'm going to say, you know what? Uh, how do we want to modify this? I'm going to say I want to add a noise in there. So now there is a random vibration on top of the, the rotation here. So how do we want to rotate it? Well, we have our H, P, and B. And I think I want this thing to spin around a whole bunch. And we learned earlier that that is heading. So we can change our heading a whole bunch. And in the same way we were just talking, we can have this like go crazy. I can put a big old number in there, complete chaos. We could also do a, a reasonable number, like 360. And now control that strictly based off of our speed. Now, I do want absolute variation in here. So if we crank the speed up, uh, I'm going to go up to like 11 here. It's just going to make it go really quick. So frame by frame, you can't see the transition. Um, and we go and set a random seed or whatever we want here. But if we go ahead and we select this tag, if I go and hit play now, you're going to see that this is randomly rotating around completely randomly. Every frame you can see it's a completely new number. But what's cool is I could be like, you know what? I also want a little bit of variation. But I like those lines being kind of vertical in general. So let's get a little bit of tilt to it, but not that much. So along those lines, we can go ahead and say, uh, let's do like five degrees there, five degrees there. Boom. Those have been updated. And now if we have that selected, then now we are going to get a little bit of tilting side to side completely randomly. But that will never loop. We can increase our timeline to a 1,000 frames, a million frames. It will just keep randomly generating per frame. We can do the same thing on position. But I want to move on really quick and talk about an additional uh, unrelated technique for adding more variation. So this null is containing all of the geometry of the character. And there's just a whole bunch of different th things combined. I want to use a displace deformer to start messing this character up a little bit. Uh, so we'll make a displacer. I'm going to drop it in here. That means it will affect all the geometry. I'm going to go into our shader. Let's go ahead and grab a noise. And instantly, you're going to see that the whole character is getting a little bit messed up, a little bit wiggly. Uh, once again, I want absolute variation. So we're going to crank the speed up to 11. Because 11, uh, I think once you get to maybe 6 or 7, it's so fast that Cinema 4D won't kind of see it between frames. So I go about double that. Um, so if I were to hit play here, you're going to see that that's kind of wiggling all over the place. So that's kind of fun. And just by coincidence, it's a good scale because in the displacer, we could go and increase our amounts. 
Now, by default, of course, the displacer is affecting the direction, and the direction here is the vertex normal, so kind of straight out from the skin, it's wiggling a little bit. And if we went too far with that, it's going to like mess up the character, and it's going to, in this case, mess it up too much. I mean, maybe that's what you're going for, but I think for us, a subtle one is working well. So that's a nice little bit of jitter that we can kind of get automatically. Um, but I want to get even more variation on top of that. So we're going to create a second displacer here. So I'm going to have it calculate on, uh, this one's going to calculate before it, that's fine, doesn't really matter. And we're going to go, actually, let's go ahead and crank this up really big. And let's go into our shader, and in this shader, I am going to tell it to be a much larger shader. The other one was very tiny, so every point was kind of being affected individually. But in this one, I'm going to start increasing the scale. Uh, let's jump up 10 times the size and see what we get. Okay, even jumping up 10 times the size, you can now kind of see the cloud of noise that this is traveling through, and it's bulging it out all over the place, but we can actually see the noise. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make it bigger than that. Let's jump it up to about 2,000. And now, okay, it's blobbing it out quite a bit. Now, that gave us a good idea of the scale, but now I'm going to go up, and let's go back to our object. And instead of it affecting the direction of the vertex normal, let's have it be based off of a plane in one of the directions. And uh, it's already, by default, set to X+, plus, which is kind of the direction that we're aiming here. So that should work well. Uh, now, we don't, definitely don't want it pushing out quite that much. But if I hit play now, we've got a noise that's kind of wiggling these bigger noises completely randomly once again. But the entire character is now jittering left and right. We can actually push the effect a little bit further, though, because if we were to rotate our camera or the character turned at a different angle, that's not the orientation of it. So if we were to go to our displacer object, I can right click and let's add a Cinema 4D tag. And it will be the look at camera tag. And once again, Z is forward. So when I click look at camera, our Z is looking straight at our camera. And that means it's deforming this based on the X when the X is relative to the displacer. So that means it's always going to be deforming left and right no matter what our angle is, no matter what the angle of the character is. So now we got that going. Let's go ahead and duplicate that displacer. And we want the exact same effect, but let's have this one traveling up and down. So let's go ahead and change our orientation to Y+. Plus. And now it's on Y+. Plus. Let's just change a different random seed on the noise so it's not identical. Crank that up. And now I can hit play, and now we've got three different layers or var variation on the character, just like, like deforming the actual geometry. So you get the little individual skin imperfections, but now the overall character is wiggling around quite a bit. So let's go ahead and do a quick render on that and just see what we end up with. So we got our crazy fairy character, and hopefully every frame we're going to be getting something completely varied from the previous one. And once again, I'm just trying to make it look as not 3D as possible. Um, so, yep. Don't know what to tell everybody here who's always striving for like perfected sketches. It's like, no, no, make it messed up. Make it look organic. Make it look like somebody actually hand drew these things. So we hit play and we get all this fun variation where it's like every single frame, like it's shifted around a little bit. The, the cell, when they're coloring it, was shifted a little bit when they took the photo. It just is really fun to, to mess. You make something cool and then you mess it up as much as you possibly can. It's, it's, it's really fun. Uh, so uh, the very, very last thing I'm going to say is we've got uh, a second executable. If you're not familiar with this, it's really powerful. Uh, Cinema 4D is like the most stable piece of software I've used. And I'm not just talking about 3D applications. I'm talking about all applications. It's like the most stable thing you use. But every once in a while, you might do something crazy, or you drag a number too high, or you drag a number too low, and Cinema 4D might start uh, hanging. And you're hoping it's going to unhang, but you have to keep on working. Uh, or uh, alternatively, maybe you, uh, you've got an important render going, and you probably should have said to save it as TIFFs, but you said it as a quick time, and now it's rendering, and you're worried you might crash, but you want to keep on working again. Something that's really fun is making a second executable. So I'm going to go down here to uh, my icon. This is really easy on a Mac, but it's similar on the PC. Go find wherever your executable is for Cinema 4D. Here I can just right click, and I can go to Options and say Show on Finder. And it's actually going to go find our Cinema 4D. Now, that's actually a shortcut to it. So I got to find the actual one. So that is this one. So there, there's Cinema 4D. That's the one I've currently got open. If I copy this, and let's see, where's there? If I make a duplicate of that, what's really cool is this file is really tiny. That's only like 8 megs, the actual executable. You can actually go and open up a second copy of Cinema 4D while the first one is open. So if you got a render going, if the other one is hanging and you're hoping it's going to wake back up again, but you got to keep on working, and you lost like a half hour's worth of work, well, it's like, OK, maybe the other one will wake up open up a second copy of Cinema 4D, and keep on working. And then if you a half hour goes by and you've now caught up, then OK, go ahead and force quit the other one. You've now gone past it. But if the other one wakes up, then you can just keep on continuing working. And if you have a second render going, that one is safe if you somehow manage to crash this version. So that's just another useful thing on there. So uh, 
That should wrap this up. A couple quick things I wanted to mention. Uh, we have just recently, this month, we are officially brought back five second projects. So head on over to grayscalegorilla.com slash five second projects. If you're not familiar, we were doing these years ago. Uh, every month we come up with a cool topic and everybody just goes and tries to make whatever you want, any kind of motion graphics. It can be stop motion animation as long as there's something that's not just video in it. Everybody works together and makes cool things and shares it and kind of competes and we put them all together. We announce some winners. It's just a really fun way of you know, making something new, making something that everybody else is working on, getting a little bit of competition. It's really fun for kind of getting the creative juices going. So we just reintroduced this. I want to make sure everybody knows about it. Um, and of course, visit grayscalegorilla.com for all of our tutorials and our training and our tools. Uh, I love hanging out with everybody when they go there. Uh, so thanks, everybody.